Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everybody, depending on where you are. Uh, very welcome to the IGP Open Day. Um, today's session um, is um, organized by all three uh, master's programs under the Institute for Global Prosperity based at the UCL. And I'm Dr. Yuan He, and I will be presenting about the IGP in general, give you a very brief introduction about IGP as an institute. And then the second half of my presentation, I will talk about the MSA Global Prosperity, the GP program specifically, before my other colleagues, uh, Conrad and Ida, talk about the PI, um, Entrepreneurship Program and the PPP, uh, People Planet Prosperity Program. So uh, the whole session will cover about an hour and uh, we will leave time for um, around 20 minutes for Q&A at the very beginning. So if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to um, leave a message. Um, then is that the way you prefer questions to be asked? Yes, great. Please leave your questions in the chat for now. And then in the Q&A, you can also raise your hand to speak. Yeah, just the uh, introduction of Dana. Dana is the Bartlett. Uh, as you know, the Institute for Global Prosperity is a house under the Bartlett um, department at UCL, which is a very famous um, world ranking, top world ranking uh, architecture department. And Dana is the communications officer coordinating all the um, open day events. Um, at the Bartlett. And we also have Francesca, who is the IGP senior uh, administrator who's helping. So you, if you, in the process of ap applying to us, you will receive a lot of email communications with Francesca. So here are the five panel members of today. And um, um, do we need to wait for a few minutes for people to come or should we just start? I think we're good to start, thanks. So um, I will start my introduction, as I, as I said, by introducing about in Institute of Global Prosperity first. So um, here, um, uh, um, a brief introduction about myself. I'm Dr. Yan He, as I said, I'm a lecturer at the Institute for Global Prosperity and also the MSAGP uh, program lead. And here you can find our uh, website, our blog, where we update uh, scholarly research and our Twitter and Instagram. So welcome to follow us on social media as well. So uh, what is the Institute for Global Prosperity? We are quite unique among academic departments because we're directly taking up the global challenges that are facing us now. Uh, what, are they, uh, what are the global challenges that you can think of? They usually include inequality, climate crisis, exclusions, and the human well-being, which require a radical rethinking of the way that we think about prosperity. So the Institute for Global Prosperity is unique because we don't only look at or explore these issues in theory, but we are also actively engaged in changing things for better. And that engagement influences our research and teaching. And as, as I introduced, you will very soon find out that we do have a lot of collaborative projects across the world. And that is a very important kind of approach of how IGP builds up the bridge between academia and the policy influences and the policy impact and making real changes to the world is composed of a very important part of the way we do research and the way in, we engage with different communities through the citizen science method that I'll introduce later. We're also unique because of our transdisciplinary approach to these challenges. So we have people from a range of disciplinary backgrounds working together on real world issues to solve them. So we do welcome students from different disciplines to apply to us uh, because such disciplinary, different disciplinary uh, knowledge will be able to find their own contribution in the IGP knowledge framework. So what are the big problems that IGP wants to tackle? First of all, we live in a world where rampant economic growth and consumption has not only failed to address the critical challenges of the day, but rather they are often the driver of such problems. So I think for students who come from probably familiar with the economic background, you might realize that the continuous emphasis on GDP and the continuous emphasis on growth didn't really be successfully transferred into the improvement of human lives and that is the problem that we want to tackle at the IGP. And here is the latest data that um, um, I extracted from the uh, 
2022 uh, World Inequality Report, and that is the date, uh, latest available. So in 2021, the richest 10% of the global population currently take home 52% of the income. The poorest half of the global population, while well, they only earn just 8%. And when it comes to wealth, um, measured as valuable assets and items over and above income, so it's accumulated effect, the gap is even wider. The poorest half of the global population just own 2% of the global total, while the richest 10% owns 76% of all wealth. We also live in a world where critical earth systems and the planetary boundaries are being breached at alarming rate and where global pandemics not only pose major public health challenges, but also expose the fragility of our economics, the vulnerability of key workers and the deep ethnic inequalities that sees minorities most affected. So these are all the major problems that we want to challenge and want to resolve at the IGP. So we might refer to these interlinked challenges as grand challenges or wicked problems. So how do we best work with communities, policymakers, and the diverse stakeholders to inclusively and also equitably, equitably redesign the economies, society, business, and environments that humanity needs for the 21st century? Well, we draw inspirations from diverse source and have many ideas and ongoing projects targeted towards these challenges we certainly don't claim that we have all the answers. So this is why we need to each of you, including our student community, including the partners we work with, and why we need to challenge you to help us to address these challenges. So when you join the IGP, you don't just study with us, rather you join a community of like-minded individuals, professors, of students, to alumni and citizen scientists from the around the world, who are committed to making changes. We expect you to be actively participant in this community to generate your own knowledge, solutions, and to go out into the world to make real changes happen. Whether working in policy, NGO, or as an entrepreneur, or in established businesses, or even in the finance sector, we expect you to become a leader and a change maker, and expect you to be involved and support you in our alumni communities beyond your year of formal studies with us. So we do keep in touch with our students even after their graduation. In other words, uh, the master studies program at IGP, whatever program among the three programs you choose, it's not just a single year, but rather a start of long-term process. And here are the list of uh, publications that we have. When you join us, you will learn about some of the more cutting edge thinkers who are challenging current economic thinking and business models. And here uh, are uh, some pictures. So we do take these pictures our, ourselves when we conduct research with different communities. And you can see the wide variety of locales and the communities that we work with. We will also invite you to become involved with the ongoing IGP research, working with citizen scientists from around the world and also in the UK. So for example, here is a picture from our project in Kenya, which is now being expanded into the whole other African countries. So covering the, trying to cover um, the whole African continent. And here's a project a picture from our Lebanon project. And here is the fast forward 2030. Uh, it's a project to specifically working with entrepreneurs uh, to address the grand challenges from the ground up through entrepreneurship. And here you can see, uh, which is also uh, one of our flag flagship projects uh, called London Prosperity Board, uh, we, where we expect to draw on the deep experience of, of a major prosperity collab research projects, which aims to work with citizens and stakeholders to develop and co-design new visions for prosperity. The London Prosperity uh, Board uh, was based um, at East London, where we currently have the UCL East campus. And IGP has been working with local uh, citizen scientists and also get involved in the regeneration of uh, East London since the um, 2012 Olympic Games started. So we have a decade long history working with uh, project um, community development East London. 
and the Proco-Lebanon and the Relief Center, which means prosperity in the age of mass displacement, helps to address specific problems that different locations face. And uh, again, this is the Kenya project, which is now being developed into a prosperity collab in Africa. And uh, um, here we also have an Asia Prosperity Cup co-led by myself and my other two colleagues, uh, which was long, launched last year. And in the Asia Prosperity Hub, we look at different um, current events in Asia and trying to bring in a lot of the Asia experience, including but li not limited to China, Korea, Japan, uh, India, Pakistan, South Asia, and a part of um, uh, the West Asia as well uh, into our research project. So um, these are the three. Uh, that was um, my general introduction about IGP as a whole institute. And here you can see we have three master's programs. And uh, the institute is led by Professor Harriet Moore, who is the founding director and also the chair of culture, philosophy, and design here at UCL. Uh, she is also a dame, as you can see from her name, which means that she also sits at the House of Lords of the UK um, apartment. And uh, we have Professor uh, Christopher Harker, who is the Deputy Director of the IGP, and the Professor Kate McLean, who is the current Director of Education at IGP. So this is the key uh, management team that manages our day-to-day -day business and the teaching. Um, here at the MSA Global, specifically, I'm now going to talk about the MSA Global Prosperity Program. So this is actually an updated course structure and as you can see, we in the UK British systems, we have three terms and our teaching is centered around the three terms. So for every term, students need to take two compulsory modules. One of them is about theoretical understanding the theories related to prosperity. The other is learning about problem, learning about methods that we can use to help students try to conduct their own prosperity research. And uh, the other option is you can choose from all the a list of optional modules we provide to our students. And you can also choose from other uh, courses offered by UCL beyond the IGP. So for every term, there's a combination of theoretical teaching, a combination of theory, and also an area of focus where you can have the flexibility to choose whatever you want to study. And the model is the same for term one and term two. And in term three, a student will be involved in a, a long uh, research process, dissertation, or what we call the dissertation module. But the idea is to use, utilize the knowledge that you've learned, both the theory and the methods that you've learned in term one and term two, and try to construct your own research that is of your own interest. And you will be assigned a specific supervisor who is linked to your research project and give you tailored guidance throughout the process. So this is how our modules, are, our program is designed. And what you will learn through the MSC Global Prosperity, uh, you will cover the big ideas of prosperity thinking from happiness, well-being to planetary limits. So these are the knowledge that we will teach. You will come to understand the critical history of economic growth and consumerism, the impact of colonialism and development, and identify the roots of today's, of today's global challenges. You will also critically interrogate alternative approaches to researching and measuring prosperity. So we do provide a lot of critical analysis of what, has, what scholars has already done or what is out there. But we don't just stop there. We want to provide what, since we have found so many problems with the status quo, what are the potential uh, options we have to make changes? And you will do that through in-depth case studies from around the world that illustrate the complex challenges and successful pathways to prosperity, and including, as I've introduced, get you involved into the IGP's own research. And you will also learn about the practice and the methods for engaging and co-design new futures with communities and stakeholders. So these are the people who will teach you these modules to give a very brief introduction. So in term one, um, Dr. Nikolai Minchev will teach the core um, theory module called the global, global Lexis related to prosperity. And I will be leading the term one research method module. And in term two, you will learn from uh, Professor Kate McLean who will talk about the global futures related to prosperity. 
and uh, Professor Christopher Harker will talk about collective problem solving, coming up with new uh, methods to teach you how to work with communities in addressing the problems. And we also have a list of excellent other staff who will uh, get involved in the in the teaching activities. And uh, um, this is not an exhaustive list, so you will be able to meet more staff once you come. And we also have a very strong uh, professional service staff, a team, um, including our institute manager, uh, um, Kiko and Francesca and Amanda, who will be helping to manage the day-to-day -day activities at, at, at the IGP. Um, here are a list of optional modules um, once you join us. But as I said before, and they cover a, lot, a variety of topics from that to China, to urban studies, to social theories, and to planetary um, research, and the two new economics for, from prosperity. The wide variety of topics for you to choose from. But of course, if, if you're not interested in uh, them, then you can choose from other UCL departments as well. So we do give students that option. So beyond studies, we do also give students extra support in terms of career. For example, uh, uh, we have program of speaker events where we invite practitioners to the IGP. We have personal leadership and professional training to give you all the practical skills you need. We also teach transferable prosperity and measurement skills, transferable writing communication skills, and other opportunities for you to develop a career beyond us. So, um, and here's a list of uh, useful links that I think Francesca might be able to share you uh, in the chat box. So um, that's all from me. And then now let's welcome um, Conrad, I think, to give introduction about the PI program. We are going to move on to um, the introduction to the prosperity people and planet from Ida. So, okay. Ida, do you have your presentation ready? Great. Yes, hold on. Thanks, Yuan. Thanks, Dana. Um, share screen. Can everybody see that? Yes. All good? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, I'll be talking about the Prosperity People and Planet MSC. Um, I'm Dr. Ida Krzyzewski, Associate Professor at Global Prosperity. So the Prosperity People Planet is a new master's degree um, that started this year. So we're teaching it currently for the first time. And it takes sort of a look, I think all the PP, all the IGP programs look at sort of the broad system, but we look at it from more environmental side than the, uh, the other programs. Um, but we look at it from the idea that the economy, environment, or nature, society, aren't three individual aspects, but they're embedded into each other. So the economy is embedded within society, which is embedded within nature. Um, and we talk a lot about natural capital and what that means to sustainable human well-being and how that interacts with the other capitals. Um, and the fact that, for example, something like ecosystem services, the benefits that we get from nature can't interact with um, human well-being directly, but have to interact with the other capitals um, for them to contribute to human well-being. We look at it from some of the big frameworks that are currently out there. Um, so this is, as all of you probably have seen, um, the SDGs, which has 17 goals, um, which include some around environment, biosphere, society, and economy, and how they're all embedded together. So we do take that holistic approach. And although we do approach it from the environmental side, we do look how that impacts society and economy as a whole. We look at, for example, tipping points. 
Um, so there are tipping points, environmental tipping points all over the world. Um, and if those did tip, those elements did tip, what that would that mean for individuals? What would that mean for our economies? Um, is there a difference between developed and developing countries? How would they act? Are there different groups that are more um, at risk or vulnerable to some of these issues? So um, so this is part of the donut developed by Kate Rayworth, um, where she took basically where she looked at the planetary boundaries developed by Johan Rockström and colleagues and said, well, we can't just manage for um, limiting change in climate and the different um, planetary boundaries, but we also have to put in a social floor. Um, so ecological ceiling and social fraud. And what does that mean? Is that achievable? Can we actually um, keep within the ecological boundaries, but then also have a social floor that we don't go under? Right now, that's not the case. Um, but is it possible globally? Is it possible per country? Um, so looking at issues like that. Um, this is a diagram that shows, and Yuan talked a little bit about GDP and the fact that um, that's not that all that's important. And here's the diagram looking at GDP on the x-axis. Sorry about that. GDP, I don't know what is going off on my phone, actually. Um, sorry about that. So GDP on the x-axis and life satisfaction on the y-axis. And you see that as it goes up, um, there's a leveling off. So in the beginning, if people don't have enough money to buy food, to buy housing, um, they need money. But as people have, let's say, a car, a house, a job, having a third car or a fourth car doesn't really increase their well-being and life satisfaction that much. Hold on. I don't know what that is. So let me just kill this whole thing. Sorry about that. That should stop it. There you go. Apologies. Um, and so we look at basically how GDP does influence life satisfaction and well-being. Um, for different societies, because it is different for different societies. It is different for different people. Um, and this is a diagram from a paper we did a few years ago that looks at one of the alternative indicators to GDP. So we talk a lot about how do you measure well-being? Is there a consensus globally? Um, how is that? So GPI is one of those that we use, the Global Progress Indicator. Um, and we see that GDP levels off around 1978 while GPI grows. And so what creates that difference between GDP and well-being? And we find that a lot of it is environmental degradation and inequality. What does that mean for society? Um, at the end of the day, what the program tries to do is see how we create a more positive future. So I love this cartoon. Um, some of you might have seen it, but it asks, you know, hey, you have this guy in um, the back going, what if this is a big hoax and we create a better world for nothing? And I think with all of us, we're thinking, you know, let's just create the better world and it'll bring everything else with it. Um, and what do we focus on? Better world for who? For what? Is it just nature? Is it just humans? How do we define that? And so we talk a lot about sort of the big picture aspects. Um, so most of the um, teaching is done by myself um, and Professor Robert Costanza, Professor of Ecological Economics, um, with guest lectures from other staff at IGP and a lot of external um, professors and experts in the field too. Um, so you'll see a lot of faces and get a lot of perspectives um, as we go. Um, so the Prosperity People Planet introduces students, especially to like the complex systems and how to look at complex systems, that interaction between society, politics, um, the nature, economics. How do you measure and model all of that? And how do you then use it for creating impact? 
whether it's policy, whether it's business, whether it's NGOs, however you want to use that. Um, like the other programs, PPP is split up into three terms. The first term you take sort of a conceptual frameworks course and a research methods course. So that's term one. The second one, uh, second term is prosperous and inclusive planetary future. So we look a lot out at how would the future look like? How could it look like? How would we get there? What does that all mean? And then we do an atelier, which is a workshop where there's no lectures. Basically, students work together on a question or a problem that is presented. Um, often we work with local communities to pose a problem that they care about. And then the rest, both of those terms, you take optional modules and you want to explain how that works. That can be within the IGP or anywhere on campus. And then the last term, you mostly focus on your dissertation. Um, I believe the careers will happen. And then thank you very much. Thank you, Ida. Now we'll move to Conrad for an introduction to the Prosperity, Innovation and Entrepreneurship MSc. Hi, everyone. Um, it's welcome to see all of you. Um, so good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, I know that we run a little bit behind the schedule, so I'll try to be really quick so we have more time for questions. Um, my name is Konrad Michukiewicz. I'm one of the lecturers at the IGP, and together with my colleague Onya Idoko, I lead on the MSc Prosperity, Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Um, what Yuan mentioned to you already is that we are very much interested in addressing wicked problems or today, including climate change, refugee crisis, youth unemployment and others. And on our specific program, we look how transformative entrepreneurs as well as intrapreneurs address these wicked problems through pursuing business opportunities, through innovation practices, through organizing and business modeling, through accessing, combining, and using different resources, as well as through uh, indigenous innovations. Um, what will you learn through MSC Prosperity Innovation and Entrepreneurship? Um, our program does a few things, which include uh, it advances a critical progressive view of transformative social entrepreneurship, which goes beyond traditional understandings of uh, entrepreneurship as a business activity, looking at entrepreneurship as institution, practice and organization. Um, it draws on theories such as community enterprise, effectuation, feminist and decolonial perspectives, decolonial design, social impact and others. It redefines entrepreneurship and innovation from the Global South perspectives. It focuses not only on consumers, but also on making societal change. It is open to different contexts and industries, as well as um, uh, entrepreneurships and entrepreneurs. And finally, uh, it explores different pathways to change. And how do we do all of these ambitious uh, uh, things? And how do we, do we achieve these objectives? So the program is structured in a similar manner to uh, the previous two ma masters, which Yuan and uh, Ida showed you. Um, so um, in short, we have two conceptual uh, um, modules and two practice-based modules. Uh, the key conceptual model, uh, module uh, is called Theories and Concepts. On this module, you will learn concepts of innovation and entrepreneurship, the definitions of transformative entrepreneurships, as well as um, case studies of transformative uh, enterprise. On the second mo uh, module in term one, you learn um, methods uh, of social science, including qualitative and quantitative research, how to do ethics, how to do a literature review. So all of these things that you will need later in addressing practical challenges, as well as in writing your dissertation. Then in term two, you move to more a practice-based activity 
activities, and this includes two modules. First one is called um, Transformative Entrepreneurship Design. And on this specific module, you build on the theories of entrepreneurship from term one to design your own enterprise that would address a sustainable development goal. On the second module uh, called Connected Innovation Project, uh, project you, would, you will work on an innovation project together with an external organization or with one of the IGP's research teams. And these projects include include things uh, such as designing a business uh, a business model for a company or designing a marketing strategy or um or designing branding for example for a for a refugee pro for a refugee project so there's a there's a number of different um of the, of different things that you could do with different organizations as part of this module and then also as um with the as in the case of the other two programs you will have a dissertation um, as part of which, um, where you will start independently develop your own uh, research-led dissertation. And you will also have an opportunity to take two uh, elective modules, either from the list um, of IGP uh, modules or from outside the, uh, the institute. And this is the IGP team. So there's Onya and myself, as well as Mara and Francesca. And then we have also our associates, including Natalie, uh, Pete, uh, Dr. Tuka Toivonen, and Ms. Solvega Paksteite. And we are very much uh, connected to Fast Forward 2030 network of young entrepreneurs, as well as we collaborate and develop our activities together with UCL Innovation and Enterprise. And this is everything I had to say. So thank you so much for listening and please ask any questions you might have. Thank you, Conrad. And now we're gonna to move to Francesca, um, who's gonna give us a brief overview of scholarships and funding available at the Institute before we move on to some questions and answers. Thank you. Um, hello, I'm Francesca. I'm the programme manager at the IGP. Um, so myself and my colleague Amanda, who isn't here today, uh, look after the administrative side of the, the running of the programmes. Um, I just want to run through a few key scholarships which are open and available for applications at the moment. Um, so the first one being the IGP Equity Fund. Um, so there are two scholarships available from this fund and they're worth £5,000 each towards tuition fees. Uh, the next is the Commonwealth Shared Scholarship Scheme. I'm sorry, the deadline for uh, the IDP Equity Fund is uh, June 30th of June 2024. Um, the next one is the Commonwealth Shared Scholarship Scheme. Now, the deadline for this is the 14th of December. So that's coming up very soon. So if you're eligible and would like to apply for that, then please do so uh, very soon. Um, I will post a link to where you can find all this information in the chat after I've spoken. Um, so they're all available on the IGP Funding Your Studies web page. Um, there are others. There are the Bartlett Promise Master's Scholarship. The deadline for that is uh, the 31st of May and they will open on the 1st of March. There is the UCL Global Master's Scholarship. The deadline for that is the 7th of May 2024. There's the Bartlett, Bartlett Promise Sub-Saharan Africa Master's Scholarship um, and the time frame for that is the 15th of Feb to the 3rd of April. Um, there is the UCL Masters Bursary, and that deadline is the 20th of June. And there's also a UCL East London Scholarship, which is open to the anyone applying for the uh, MSC Pi LPPP programmes. Um, and but the, I don't have the deadline for that yet, but it's usually around June. Uh, that will be updated on the website once we have that deadline. Um, and we do have students um, on these scholarships um, on our programme. So it really is worth applying if you are eligible to do so. And all of the information about um, the eligibility criteria, uh, what the value of these scholarships are, how to apply and the deadlines is all available on the website, which I'll post the link to in the chat in just a moment. Um, and yeah, that was all from me. Thank you, Francesca. I can see that we have quite a few questions in the chat. Um, at first, I'd just like to invite everyone to please turn on their cameras if you feel comfortable to do so, if you're able to do so as well. Um, the first question is from Zuleika, who asks, for the Global Prosperity MSc, what kind and level of work experience would an ideal student have? So perhaps Francesca and Yuan, you can answer that one. 
Yeah, I can answer that one. Um, uh, we don't have hard kind of work experience requirement. For example, we don't say, oh, you need at least two years of working experience to come to the IGP. But according to past experience, having past work experience really helps students in figuring out what you want to get out of the program. Because, you know, um, the Masters of Global Prosperity program among the three programs, if we can put it very simply, it's more focused on social and societal issues related, right? So in the past, we have students, for example, this year, we have students who worked in the NGO or who runs the NGO in Africa. Uh, we have another student who used to work for the Vietnam Vietnam government uh, in collaboration with the United Nations. So he has work experience when we talk about development projects and the developed indexes, for example, the human development uh, index or a lot of GDP measurement. He has firsthand experience because he has processed those data. We also have students who previously worked in the financial sector and they now, um, including investment banks, and they now, a lot of these banks, because of uh, all the care about uh, ethical investment, about ESG related investment, right? So these banks now require people who do have the uh, societal knowledge related to investment. For example, what is sustainable investment? What is ethical investment? What is ESG related portfolio? How would you construct it? They require these people to have not only the finance knowledge, but also the social knowledge to be able to carry on these projects and also uh, consulting firms as well. Uh, we also have a lawyer this year who used to be a lawyer, but he find that um, because he want to bring law to um, realize social justices, so he needs to understand more about what does the social justice mean before um, he can implement his previous work experience knowledge with a new social dimension to it. So we do have students from a diverse background and uh, having a working experience really helps you to understand what you want to get out of the program and to plan uh, the master's program with us, um, how you want to use your time and what you can get out of it. So um, there is no hard requirement, but working experience is encouraged. That's great. And then we have another question for the Global Prosperity MSc yeah. uh, from Mayalan. Sorry if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly. Uh, the question asks, can the dissertation be done in collaboration with an institution or organization or business to solve a real problem? Yes, we actually encourage students to do that. And we also provide opportunities to help students connect with uh, communities. For example, we do we have collaborated with the UCL uh, Community Research Initiative for quite a few years. So how it works is for many international students, if you're new to the UK, you want to say implement the knowledge to help an institute to solve a practical problem. You don't usually uh, get immediate trust of this institute, right? You don't know where to find this institute and you don't know how to get connected with them. At UCL, there's a, a student-led, uh, but not only managed by students. So there is a full-time staff dedicated to it. So they, they usually this, uh, including NGOs, charities, local communities, uh, they would come to us with a specific question and say, okay, this is the question that I'm, my institution is now faced. I want to solve this problem. And um, the UCL CRI, Community Research Initiative, would put an advertisement uh, on the website for this institute. And our master students will be able to connect with institute. And they were also... Uh, and that is how students get connected with the social need through the UCL as a kind of a hub, who also helps students to manage, who help to train students, provide assistance throughout the research process. And obviously you will also have your own supervisor from the IGP who help to guide your research. So this is not, um, it's yes, you have the opportunity. And even if you don't have a community or project in mind, we will help you to develop it through our uh, master's program. Yeah. And this opportunity is available to all three programs, so not just to GP. Great. And now we have a question for Conrad. How many years of working experience does this does the Prosperity Innovation and Entrepreneurship Program cohort have? And what are the backgrounds of the people who have participated in the past? Um, uh, thank you so much for this question. Uh, I have to say that it varies. So we have a mix of students. Uh, some of whom would be 
coming straight from undergrad uh, and quite a lot of Asian students come uh, straight from undergrad. Um, and then we also have students who are sort of at the beginning of their careers, having maybe three to five years experience. So students who are like in the age of like 25, 20, uh, 28. And then, I, so I would say that probably 30% would be students at the age of 22. Uh, another 40% would be students at the age of between 22 and 28. And then maybe maybe around to 10 to 15 percent would be students who are at the later stage um, of uh, their careers. And then the backgrounds, again, they, they vary. So we get students from a lot of students from business backgrounds. So including including management, accounting, um, but also economics. And then we get some students from social sciences, including psychology, sociology, geography. And also increasingly, we get students who come from engineering backgrounds and so who who have some uh, engineering knowledge and experience and try to turn it uh, into uh, something good uh, for for the world or who are who are thinking about how to mobilize technologies in, in, in addressing global challenges. So it's a it's it's a very mixed bag. Thank you, Conrad. Next, we have three questions from Sion. About... I, I, I see them, so I Great. can, I think it'll be easier for me just to, yeah, okay. Thanks, um, thanks Sion, for the question. Um, so the first one is, um, how similar is PPP to ecological economics? Um, it's not an ecological economics degree. Um, however, Robert Costanza is the father of ecological economics, and I'm an ecological economist. And so a lot of our frameworks and mentalities and teachings are from the ecological economics perspective. So some of the figures um, that I showed, you'll probably recognize um, that are used quite often um, in ecological economics. So that mentality will be the same in a lot of um, what we teach are core aspects of ecological economics. I hope that answers your question, that one. Um, how much quantitative analysis skills is required? So during the modules um, themselves, not much actually. Um, you won't need a lot of economics or statistical background to do the modules themselves. Um, you have the opportunity to use quantitative um, analysis or statistics or economics during your dissertation. And that's your choice on which methodology you want to use. But during the modules, you will not be expected um, to have that background or um, a strong understanding of quantitative analysis. And is there opportunity, your third question is, is there opportunities for field work? Um, so IGP does some internships and does connect students um, to certain um, organizations and projects that you will have the opportunity to work on. And I believe Francesca, Johan, or Conrad, who have been at IGP much longer than I have, will be able to talk more about that. Thanks. Hope that answered your questions. Okay, maybe we can move to the next question. Um, on the Global Prosperity course, what are the key benefits or takeaways from undertaking the program? So what foundations does it provide for the workplace? I guess you are asking how would the degree help with job search? To put it more uh, straightforward, uh, the, as I've said, this is the transdisciplinary interdisciplinary program, uh, which means that uh, which is which means that we 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 are not kind of a traditional professional training like a kind of degree where if you take a accounting degree you will be trained as a accountant, uh, if you take a financial analyst degree you will be trained as a banker. I don't think we have that kind of a kind of a one way forward career trajectory, and it really depends on students' interest. And we do see a lot of student when when it comes to careers, a lot of diversity in terms of how students um, take on the project. From here, for example, we have students who is now uh, start their own uh, social enterprises because they 
want to use, uh, apply the practical challenges that they've learned uh, from the degree to a specific context they are familiar with. For example, last year, I supervised a student who worked on uh, women's health in Malaysia, and because she has a kind of HR background and she also have a family connection in the health business, so she wants to do something about how how we how we rethink about women's prosperity in terms of uh, from the health perspective and how instead of treating like a kind of a female related diseases as a kind of a specific diseases related to certain organs or certain body uh, parts, we really need to look at holistically a woman's life trajectory and all kinds of health needs that women need. And this is a kind of teaching or kind of mentality change we bring to students, right? We, we, we urge students to think more, uh, as Ada said, systematically about the problems that are facing the social uh, social uh, challenges. We we'll also have, as I said, students from law, how they could apply ethical societal uh, injustice and then use law to change uh, the problems we face, and they be, may become, say, human rights lawyers later on, where they try to learn what is what does it mean when we say human rights, what kind of societal impact, what kind of dignity, or what constitutes a good human life. We also have uh, students later on who, who work for government, uh, especially for public policy making. I think that is where usually students will go to, but also on the business side, I think we are seeing more and more emphasis on ethical business nowadays, which is a really good fit for our program because we do talk a lot about the social challenges and the social problems. But in the end, if you want to solve the problem, you need to combine knowledge learned here from actually a, a, a career or trajectory that fits would fit your own interest. So um, I, I hope I know that it's a bit vague, but I don't think our program can provide a very kind of a tailored, just like a, accounting for accountant, that kind of matching um, criteria for students. But it also means that you do have the flexibility of exploring um, a lot of the current problems that we face in different industries and try to combine the knowledge together. Thanks, Frederick, for your question and Yuan for your answer. Uh, a question for Conrad from Victoria. Could you please share more examples of connected innovation projects students have engaged with in the past? Yeah, so, so there was a, a number of different projects usually relating to somebody's research work or to um, whatever our partners were doing at that moment in time. So these projects including um, included, uh, for example, there was a project on how to include uh, young residents of Islington and Camden in the uh, job opportunities uh, created in the uh, King's Cross uh, technology, cl technology cluster, including Google, Facebook, DeepMind, and others. Um, there was a project on carbon accounting and calculator for carbon accounting designed by uh, one of our professors, um, Jacqueline McGlade, who used to be the head of um, the uh, the chief uh, uh, scientist at uh, United Nations Environment Program. Um, there was another project by Professor Jackie McGlade, uh, which was on uh, reg uh, regenerative agriculture in Essex and Sussex. There was a project on um, creating ec ecosystem for small enterprises in Lebanon. Um, there was one on branding for, for one of the uh, key fashion retailers, and then there was there was also like a number of uh, of others. So the, the, they were a really broad chat, mainly focusing on on social innovation, but with some some mainstream innovation included as well. Great. We have another question from Victoria for both Ida and Yuan. What would you say is the biggest difference between the Global Prosperity and the Prosperity People and Planet programs? Ida, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, we get that question a lot, actually. And um, there is being uh, um, a short video being released probably in the next week, which talks about all three programs and their differences. Um, but I think the short answer is that um, the PPP program looks at some of these big global problems 
and solutions um, from an environmental problem and brings in society and the economy um, into that and how it relates. But we do spend, I believe, and you want correct me if I'm wrong, we spend um, a more time on the environmental aspects and some of the impacts that happen there. Yeah, that is true. And that is also reflected in terms of, say, let's think about the course content that you are learning. Um, I think the GP program, although like I think a lot of the big challenges we face are always interconnected. For example, we do have GP students who become social entrepreneurs um, where they can also audit the PI program mod uh, optional modules. So take some of the PI courses as optional modules. So within the Institute, there is a kind of inflow of knowledge among the three programs. Uh, but in terms of the specifically the GP program, we, for example, the main theory courses, we do teach students, for example, uh, what's the problem with GDP? Uh, what is the problem? What are the existing development models out there? What's the history of development? What is the critique of it? What does it mean uh, when we say post-development? Uh, we also bring in critique of colonialism, how colonial the colonial history itself constitutes or creates a lot of the development problems that we are facing that uh, in developing countries. We will also teach altern alternative critical theories such as feminism, uh, decolonizing theories. Uh, we teach a financial crisis, Asian financial crisis, or different financial crisis in different countries. So overall, I think the GP module, uh, which is populism, for example, the GP module would align more with what students traditionally would think would be covered in a social science degree, including uh, politics, sociology, and anthropology. I think we draw a lot of um, theories, inspirations, and also economics, of course. Um, we draw a lot of inspirations from these traditional, the so-called uh, big social science disciplines, but with a critical perspective and also with the prosperity kind of uh, approach to the problems traditionally addressed under these disciplines. Great. Hopefully that answers your question, Victoria. Um, Ida, did you want to take the last question from Sion about the PPP program? Sure. Sorry. I'm um, sorry. I'm also like to ask about experience level of students PPP from this year and the number of students if possible. Um, so this year we have about 30. <laughs> Francesca, you might have to... Um, correct me on the final number, but it's just around 30. Um, I think we're hoping to get it up to about 40 um, next year um, and sort of kind of cap it at 40. Um, the experience of students in PPP this year, it's actually really cool because there's a lot of diverse uh, people coming in. Sorry, my pup's barking. Shush, sweetie. Um, but so there's it's quite diverse. Um, so there's some people that are coming back from an art history background. There are people that are coming in from biotech background. Um, there's a lot of environmental studies per people. There's um, backgrounds in economics. There's a few engineers. Um, so it's quite diverse, um, which makes the conversations really interesting in class because everybody comes at these issues from a different perspective um, and from a perspective from all over the world. So um, that's been really good. Um, so yeah, but I think we're open to different backgrounds. Great, thank you, Ida. Does anyone have any final questions? Feel free to also raise your hand or unmute yourself. Um, maybe just before we finish, um, I can uh, provide a few tips about application process. So we do receive, we do read a lot of, uh, um, we do receive a lot of applications and I would highly encourage students who want to apply uh, pay do pay attention to your personal statement uh, try to combine and uh, clearly state why you want to study in this program and combine it with your personal experience to make 
a, a good fit to to show that how come you how you can become a good fit for this program and how what you can get from this program. And I think a lot of the personal statement that we've received reads very generic, which means that they can be applied almost to anybody, can be used by anybody. But if you submit a personal statement like that, it cannot make you stand out among a large cohort, right? So try to combine your understanding for example, the knowledge, the key takeaways, the most interesting points that you've learned from today's session and combine it with your past personal experience to construct a unique personal statement that is persuasive enough and try to avoid a very generic and uh, personal statement that sounds the same to everybody and uh, try to be authentic, try to be genuine when you write your personal statement. I think that is one tip that I can give to students. If you're interested, reply, and uh, you're very welcome to reply. Thank you, Yuan. Does anyone else want to share any more tips, replications? <laughs> if not, I think we can close there. Thank you so much to everyone for joining us today in this open day session. It was great to speak with you all, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Thanks so much. Thank you for joining us.